Welcome to our amphitheater hot shop. We've got quite the program for you down here today. I'm going to introduce the team and leading the team today, our gaffer is going to be Jeff Mack. Let's give Jeff a nice round of applause. He's going to be assisted by Katie Hubbs, Helen Tegler. My name is Chris Rochelle. We've got Matt up in the booth who's going to do some AV work for us with the cameras. And Amanda Kranz is going to be monitoring our online content and activity. So this is actually a live streamed program. And Jeff is going to be making this same exact piece right here. Isn't this beautiful? sculpture of a bowl. So everybody that's here in the amphitheater, if you take a look to your left, you can see one of the originals that Jeff made. And this was a collaboration between uh, Red Bull and our museum here. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that as we carry on. But this will be about an hour and a half demonstration. We're going to make use of the entire shop. If you folks here have any questions throughout the process and I'm available at that time, I'm going to jump in and give them a hand at certain moments. But shoot your hand up, get my attention. And anybody that's online, uh, you can ask those questions real time to Amanda and she can field them our way and we'll do our best to answer them. But anybody here seen glass making before in general? Okay. This is going to be a sculpted piece. We are going to be doing some glass blowing, but for the most part, this will be solid sculpture. We're going to use two different workstations. We're going to use a, an oven called the garage. So where Jeff is right now, he's actually standing on the far right side of our space. And that oven that's on the right side of him is our garage. And that's where we can put components for the bowl and babysit them. So when we work with this type of glass, this is called soda lime, we can work it in its molten state and we can reheat it using reheating furnaces. You're gonna see torches used to help that. But we can't let anything cool too much as we work it. When we're done with a piece of glass, we have to place it into an oven for slow cooling. That process is called annealing and that has to begin at 900 Fahrenheit. So we can't let anything we make dip below that too quickly. That's when glass will suffer thermal shock. It will crack. Um, so we're going to put this into an oven for the final step, the cooling process, which for this particular piece, because it's pretty thick, this is a solid bowl, um, we're going to let this cool over 24 hours time. I'll talk a bit more about that. But my point was the garage is held at about 1,000 degrees. So at 1,000 degrees, you can make components. They're rigid at 1,000. We can make the face to the bowl. We can make some components, put them in the garage to babysit them while he makes the body, and then we'll join the face and whatnot and all that. Um, so the color that he has here, this is the same color, right? So this is this neutral gray. So this very pretty transparent neutral gray. It's a color that we buy from a, a German factory called Reichenbach. They've been in the business of making color for glass like this for about 200 years. And this is one of my favorite grays. It's actually kind of like the tint to an, uh, a window on an automobile. Sure, so what additives make that color? Let's back up just a little bit and talk about glass itself. Can anybody here tell me the main ingredient to glass? Sand, yep, silica sand or silica dioxide. You mix soda ash and limestone in with that. If those are pretty clean and you melt them down, you get the glass that's inside our furnace. Now it does look orange because it's glowing. It's at 2,100 Fahrenheit. He just dipped in for our first gather over that little bit of gray. To make colors, you mix in different metallic oxides or metallic chlorides, even metallic salts. Uh, so this gray, I'm going to guess, I would guess comes from maybe chromium mixed in there. I don't actually know. I can tell you, though, cobalt makes a rich dark blue. Iron oxide makes a nice green. Purples come from manganese. Copper can be used to make that light teal blue. Some of my favorites, the pinks, the fuchsias, and the, the ruby tones come from gold, gold chloride mixed in. So that company, Reichenbach, and there are several factories around the world that produce color like that, uh, they mix their own batch. That's what the raw materials are called, the silica sand, soda ash, and limestone. And they add their own different materials, those uh, metal oxides and chlorides, to change the colors. So most studios will melt clear glass like we have in that main furnace. And you're going to see us use that furnace quite a bit. There's close to 1,000 pounds of clear in there. When you start with clear, you can add whatever colors you want through the process. And the method that we're using today is to melt down some color bar. And this is a piece right here. This kind of looks black, doesn't it? This is a really nice transparent green. It's the same green that's in this bowl down here, just in a very condensed format. So one piece, we could split this little chunk into two, and I can melt it onto the end of a pipe and make a bowl, two bowls out of this. And once you inflate it long, uh, big enough, you stretch it, it starts to reveal its true color. But remember, the clear glass looks orange, the gray looks orange, the blue, they all look bright orange when they're this hot. We're going to keep it around 2,000 degrees for the most part. So Jeff has asked Helen to start up the next component. And we're going to be doing a couple different techniques to apply this color. Um, one method that Helen will do pretty soon is called an overlay. So we're going to heat up a little piece of that gray, 
drop it onto a bubble that she'll make, and then we'll make the cup. Um, and I'm going to talk you through this. I know I don't want to get too complicated with it just yet, but you're going to see a lot of different ways to apply this color. We can make use of this torch. If you hear me talk about that torch, I call it the hot, most of us call it the hot torch. Um, there's another torch that's going that uses just propane, but the hot torch has oxygen mixed in with natural gas. And I know all torches are hot, but when you put oxygen into it, you can get that up to about 4,000 degrees, which is incredibly hot. This reheating oven that he uses, we have two of them up here, and Helen's gonna make use of the smaller one. And this has natural gas with forced air mixed in. So there's a blower on each one. And this really neat view that you get uh, is from a camera mounted safely behind that oven. It's not actually exposed to the heat. It would not last. There's a little window of fused silica mounted in the back of that oven. That's a very special type of glass that can withstand over 3,000 degrees of temperature without anything happening to it. So the camera can look through that, no problem. But Jeff is making, I, this is going to be for the, the head of the bowl, correct? Yes. Yep. Okay, the tail and the head. So Jeff's going to make these tiny little, we call them color cups. Now, it's not a cup like you would drink from, um, but it's just a color cup that we're going to fill with clear glass eventually. One of those, he's dividing them into two. One's going to turn into the head of the bowl, and the other one's going to be for the tail and the hooves. And then Helen uh, momentarily will start the cup for the body. So if you look at this piece, it looks like the whole thing is gray glass, correct? The outside, there's a very thin layer of gray. Most of this is clear glass. Um, so the color is pretty dense, as I mentioned. So we need to stretch it quite a ways so it's transparent enough to see through, to see into. But if you just made this out of solid color bar, you could do it. But one, it would be really expensive because the color is not cheap. But also, you wouldn't be able to see through it at all. So we want to take a little veil of color. We're going to make a series of cups and fill those cups with clear glass and then you can sculpt that form. The color will be on the surface. Does everybody follow? OK. There's another much faster method to use as opposed to these color cups, which take a little bit of time to prepare. But it's a very different effect. Um, and I think the color cups are much, much nicer. We could use little chips of colored glass. This is called frit. We could use powder as well. There's powders that have been grind down really fine. So if I dump this onto this table or into a big pan, you could take gathers of clear glass, and you could roll through the frit and melt it in. You basically get the same kind of tone as the gray, but you'd end up with these little speckles, these little dots from the frit melting in. So this bowl is a good example of that. So if you just want a nice even, a nice clean veil of color, you have to do the method that we're doing right now. Or you could melt a furnace full of that gray glass to the tint that you want it, but we only have one furnace going, and it's full of clear glass. So color cups it is. All right, so I think Katie has taken the gathers to fill this particular cup. Now, to fill this, we need to break this cup. Oh, no, he's actually just going to drip it right into it. So he's opened that cup up to a nice uh, flared opening to drip this material right into it. So he fills it with that clear glass, cuts it free. The shears that he's using right there are called diamond shears. I'll show you what those look like. Specialty shear and glass blowing. The blades, when they squeeze together, they're angled and they create that diamond profile, hence the name. They're really good for a variety of things. You can crimp glass with the blades. You can terminate and cut through. You can grab and pull glass with them as well. So once we really start to sculpt the details, the horns of the head, the legs, the tail and whatnot, you're going to see him utilize the diamond shears quite a bit. But the tool that he's got right here are called jacks. It's one of my favorite tools. They're very versatile. The jacks are blades attached to a spring steel grip. We put beeswax on them as a lubrication. Um, so he can use those to kind of squeeze over the bubble. And he just closes that color pattern off. So he had to have it open to fill it with clear glass. But now he wants to close it off so the whole thing is, the color is cinched around the whole thing. But you'll see him use the jacks a few different times in a few different ways. A little bit more about the collaboration. Um, so I think it was a couple years in the making. And just recently, in the past month, uh, Jeff Mack, Katie Hubbs, Tom Ryder, I think Eric Meek was down here as well, all worked to create um, a lot of different glass during a special filming when the Team Red Bull was here. When uh, that t Red Bull Action Sports, do I have that right? And Aaron Colton. Uh, is the, the rider for that team that came out here. Now, he does some really special bike builds. So he's a motorcycle rider, and he built this all-electric bike 
that he was able to ride in the museum and through the museum for this filming. You can catch that film, it is available, it's up on YouTube now, um, and you can actually go through this, I was writing this down earlier, visit.cmog.org slash Red Bull, and that will take you to all of that content. Um, but it was really wild. The team was down here making glass while Aaron was riding the bike around him. That bull was one of the, the pieces that the team produced during that shoot. Also our AV and our events team, big shout out to them for staying here. It was an after hours event while the museum was closed. So I think they were filming until about four in the morning, but absolutely amazing footage. It's worth checking out. Definitely do so if you can. But to sculpt glass, we can use the heat from the reheating furnace, which again is 2,000 degrees, and that softens everything at the same time. But very useful is that hot torch, because when he starts to sculpt the details or he gets the bulk of material moved where he wants it, if he wants to spot heat, tiny little spots, he can do that with that torch. He can dial the temperature up and down, concentrate the flame to a little pinpoint or broaden it quite a bit, and you can really localize heat where you need it and soften the glass very quickly. And you're gonna see him use that torch a lot. And for much of this process, you're gonna see Katie taking a lot of reheats for Jeff, especially once we start to get the body of the bowl in action here, because it is pretty heavy, it's solid glass, so she'll be moving back and forth to the oven. That allows Jeff as the gaffer to stay seated at the bench and have his tools in hand and just get right to work. And when you're sculpting little details in glass, seconds really matter because this material stiffens up very, very quickly. You can actually see where those, uh, the points that he's pulling out there, I believe for the horns right now, once they get cast pretty thin away from the mass of material he has, you see that there's no more orange glow. Almost instantly they stiffen up and become pretty rigid. Want me to take that, Helen? Yeah. Okay, so Helen has the piece of color for the body of the bowl, so she'll create a little bubble on the blowpipe, and I'm gonna reheat or start to soften this chunk of transparent gray. And this has been portioned to accommodate the size of the body that we're gonna make. So the, the amount of color that he used um, for the little cup for the head and the color for the tail, much smaller than the piece of color we have for the body. And you have to learn the colors, you have to learn the densities of them, but when you start to prep things and get ready for a project like this, you don't want the body to be much, much lighter than the head, you want it to match. So you have to say, well, how much color am I gonna need? What's the volume that I'm going for? And break off those pieces of bar accordingly. When the bar comes to us from that company, we order them per kilo. And so one kilo bar is usually about, I don't know, 12 inches or so in length. Okay. So Helen has gathered up a little bit of glass. She just, she said she cut out a bubble. In the process of melting and sometimes gathering from our furnace, you can create little air bubbles or little air bubbles will form. And if you gather those air bubbles, it doesn't destroy the piece per se, but if you want to get rid of them for a nice, cleaner look, then you can pluck them out with some tweezers and cut them out of there, and that's what she did. But you'll see her form a bubble in just a moment. She shapes and centers that glass first with a tool called a block. This is a cherry wood scoop that's been soaked in tap water. And a new method for us nowadays to be blowing glass is to use compressed air. She has attached a blow tube to the mouthpiece of the pipe. She's tapping a foot pedal Let's air pressure through that line into the pipe and ultimately into the glass. We're doing this because here at work we have to keep our masks on, we can't put our mouth on the pipe. We get a lot of questions about that system when people watch us use it. One of them is how much pressure is needed and not very much at all. You might be pretty surprised to know that it's literally a whisper of, of air pressure. We have that set to about one and a half PSI but when the glass is this hot, it is extremely soft. It inflates very, very easily. You can overdo it. If you blow too hard, you can blow the glass really thin. You can actually pop the bubble when it's really hot if you blow too hard. For this overlay, she's made that bubble. She's gonna let that bubble turn rigid. We need it to be nice and stable before I drop this color onto the bubble. And I'm getting this nice and soft, and I'm shaping it up to kind of a teardrop. Let me marble one more time, Helen. Cora, this is still a little, a little rigid. But I'm working a good amount of heat into this piece of color. I want this to be liquid when we drop it onto the bubble so she can cut it free easily and peel it over that bubble 
with no problems. And the table that I'm using to do a little shaping here is called a Marver. It's just a steel table. That feels pretty good. I'll be ready this time, Helen. But she stands the pipe straight up in the air. This allows us to drop this color onto the tip, onto the center point of the bubble. You'll see her use those diamond shears as well, and cut it free, and then she'll go through the steps to make the overlay. So here's where we're really making use of the entire shop. Jeff and Katie are finishing up the details of the bowl head. Once that is done, it's going to go into our garage to be put on hold. And we're kind of timing this. We did a trial run. This is actually the bowl that we made Monday, Tuesday, I can't remember, a few days ago, Monday. Um, and the whole team, the same team that was down here. So we ran through the process. We timed it. It was almost exactly an hour and a half, the length of our program tonight. And it went very, very smoothly. So we're just planning on doing everything the same. Does anybody here have any questions about this or anything glass related, our museum, that collaboration? If you do, just shoot your hand up. Yes. It's something new since COVID. Yeah, the air com uh, compressed air system. These blow tubes run into our box right here that actually has natural gas, propane, oxygen, and, and air going to it, uh, hooked up to the floor vents. And we put this into place a little more than a year and a half ago. During our shutdown, when the pandemic first hit, we shut the doors to the museum for the first time ever, I believe, um, or if, since the flood of 72, if I have my dates right. Anyway, yes, we closed the museum. And when we were allowed to reopen, we knew that we were going to coming back wearing masks. And we couldn't take them off. So we had to figure out a new way to blow glass. This system is new here at the museum, and it's new to us, the glass makers, but it's not an entirely new system. There are places that utilize that. We have found that it's quite efficient. So we can sit at the bench, latch that tube on, press the foot pedal with our foot while we're turning the pipe and shaping the glass at the same time. Before that, and without that, you could do the same thing by having your assistant come over and do the inflation and blow through the pipe for you. And that is the most common thing to see in a glass studio. There are trade-offs to both. Right? It is really efficient. You can do all that work on your own now. But the one thing that I really miss about being able to blow with your mouth is to feel that bio relay. So when you're blowing through a pipe, you can feel the softness or stiffness of the glass, and you can adjust the pressure instantly. You can blow harder or softer if you need to. This system can be turned up and down, but it's a little hard to do that on the fly. So we kind of set it at one pressure, and that's where we keep it. But six and one half dozen the other. That being said, a lot of people ask us, will you keep it around? Are you, do you like it? Will it continue to use it? Certainly, it's already been put into place. It's a great tool. We will keep it, but we're looking forward to when it's an option. Yep. But it has been nice. It's allowed us to continue working um, through the times and to be able to blow glass. So this is one of many transfers that you're going to see the team go through. We flip pieces around by attaching a handle called a punty. Now, we call the solid rods punty. So if you hear us saying, can you bring me a three-quarter punty or gather up, um, that's what we're referring to. But when we say bring me a punty for a piece, then that is actually where we make a little handle using some glass as more or less a glue to stick to a piece temporarily. And that's what Katie just made. So Jeff just gave me a little hand motion there to start gathering the glass for the body of the bowl while Helen is working up and finishing that overlay process. So we have different size rods, different size blowpipes. And this will be solid sculpture, so we don't really need to have it on a blowpipe. But we like to use this pipe for this amount of material for a couple reasons. One, the diameter is larger, so we have more torque. It's got a nice rubber grip on it, so it's really good to control as you're turning. But also, the head of the pipe compared to a punty has been flared at the top. Um, that just gives us the ability to gather a little bit more material and manage the larger gathers a little bit better on it. So I'm going to build some layers we call gathers as Helen is finishing that overlay. And then ultimately, we'll be making the cup for the body of the bowl. Matt, can we roll that gathering animation if that is queued up and available? We have a really neat animation. We'll see if we can get it to roll for you all. And it shows what we're doing when we dip into this oven. We have a big ceramic crucible inside of it that holds our glass. Again, the temperature in there is 2,100 degrees Fahrenheit, powered with natural gas and forced air. And 
at that temperature, this particular glass has the same viscosity as sort of warmed up table honey. That's why we have to build it in multiple layers. I can hear Helen gathering right now. You can hear that furnace when we open up the door, the combustion. There's one burner firing into it. There's that animation. This is exactly what Helen's doing right now. So we open the door. We dip down into that ceramic pot. We can actually see the head of the pipe dipping into that molten glass. When we submerge to the level that we're after, we start to make those rotations. That's where you have to have really good dexterity and just muscle memory, really, um, to be able to gather glass clean. I think it's one of the hardest things to properly do when you first start blowing glass. You don't have muscle memory, you don't have that fine-tuned dexterity as a beginner, and you kind of fumble around a little bit. But when the glass is that hot, then you really fumble with it and it can drip all over the floor. Now everybody out here has a lot of experience. Uh, Jeff has, I believe, the most coming up on 30 years full-time. Helen and myself, over 20. Katie's been blowing glass for about 10 years. And it takes most people, usually say about three to five years of full-time work in a glass studio to get the basic set of skills down, to get comfortable with just taking gathers, to get comfortable with turning a blowpipe and using the basic tools, going through some of the basic procedures that are necessary. So it looked like the head of the bowl just popped off from the punty, but if they do that quick enough, they can reheat the punty with a torch, as Jeff just did, and stick it back onto the head of the bowl. So nice save, nice save. You can clap for that if you like it. That's totally fine. We like the energy and the enthusiasm. It's not always about what you can make in a glass studio, but sometimes what you can fix. The pipes that we work with and the punties are, most of the ones we have out here are stainless steel, which for a metal is not a great conductor. We can hold on to usually half of the pipe without burning ourselves. You've seen Helen and I make use of this pipe cooler though which just gives you more access to the pipe, better leverage, better control, especially when you come out of that furnace with bigger gathers. Or if the level of the furnace drops quite a bit and you have to dip deeper down into that pot to collect the glass, then the pipe will heat up quite a bit and cool it off. In between these gathers that I'm taking, doing a little shaping, keeping everything centered as best I can, but doing a little bit of shaping, and I'm stabilizing this layer, this core. I'm cooling the glass, and the metal really pulls heat from it very quickly. If I dip this into that glass too soon, and this core is still too soft, it's really hard to control. And actually, for this final move, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the procedure to stuff the final cup for the body of the bowl. Um, but Jeff has worked through this many, many times. I would say he's probably made more than a dozen of these bowls in the last several months in preparation for that collaboration with Red Bull. And he found that letting the core of this go really cold, so really rigid before taking one final gather and filling in the cup gives him a lot of time to be able to heat the surface and make a lot of the contours for the, uh, the body of the bowl without the core of this getting too soft. And I'll explain that a little further. You have a question? Yeah, someone was wondering if Jeff prefers more traditional like blown glass work or sculpting more. Jeff, there's a question if you prefer more like traditional blown glass work or if you like sculpture more or if it's sort of half and half. All the same, All the same to him, he says. Jeff is a very diverse glass maker. I have seen him work Venetian style, making very intricate, very thin goblets, but I've seen him sculpt pieces like this bowl, and it's very two very different things, but he's very, very good at all of it. How's that look, Jeff? Do you want me to dump some of that off? Keep it? Just a little bit? Okay. Right, right. So I'll dump a little bit of that gather that I took off into that bucket of water, just portioning it off. 
Jeff will take the final, we call a skin gather on this, once he's ready, once we have the cup shaped up. That bucket that I just dumped this off into, and I think Helen did the same with her gather, it's just a bucket of water. That molten clear glass hits that water and it breaks down very quickly into tiny little pieces. That's called cullet, and we remelt that. It's all clear glass, it's totally reusable. We can shovel it right back in the furnace, melt it right back down. So I'm also thinking about the shape of this gather for Jeff and the cup that he's gonna stuff. So we wanna get this form that I have as close to the inside shape of the cup that Helen's making. So it fits in there nicely. When we go to do it this time, you're gonna see us take the cup that Helen's making, break it free from the pipe that she's on, place it straight up and down into a mold close to the bench at Jeff here. And then he'll have this quantity of glass with a little layer on the outside of it. Straight up and down, he'll drip it right into the cup. And that is a very tricky procedure. We call it a stuffed cup. And you have to have your sizes just right. You have to be lined up just right. Because as soon as you touch hot glass to hot glass, it sticks. And if you stick it in the wrong spot, you can't stuff the cup properly and a lot can go wrong. All right, I think that looks pretty good. What do you think, Jeff? Is that all right? A little pointier? You got it. Here, Helen is working down that constriction with the jacks. She's inflated that small quantity of gray with a little bit of clear glass around it to a pretty good size, pretty good volume. I think if you taper that a little bit more, because he wants me to point this up a little bit more, yeah. Helen's using a newspaper pad, folded up newspaper that's been soaked in water. She's doing some shaping with that. All right, that's a little point here. How's that, Jeff? All right. So now I'll just hang out with this. I'm gonna let this get really cold. Zero movement to it. Another question? Yeah, it's been a while since we've done it, so I forgot. Um, if you're melting boro in a furnace, does it require the furnace temperature to be higher than what we have here? Yes, if we're melting borosilicate in a furnace, does that require having a higher temperature than we have in our furnaces here? And absolutely, yes, it does. Anybody here heard of borosilicate glass? Raise your hand if you've heard of Pyrex. Lots of people, okay. Pyrex is a brand name, and that type of glass is called borosilicate. It's a higher temp glass, but it's also uh, able to withstand really rapid temperature change. So that's what makes it really nice for kitchenware and whatnot. But it is a higher working temperature and to melt it to the same viscosity that we have here, I don't know the exact temp, but I would say over 2300 Fahrenheit. So at least a few hundred degrees hotter than what we have ours at. But Pyrex or borosilicate in general, great for labware because you can take a vial or a tube or a glass, anything, uh, any form from room temp. And you can put a flame right to it and heat it up very rapidly. It has a lower thermal expansion than our glass. So basically, why we have to put something into an oven to babysit it with soda lime glass, or why we have to slowly cool it, that process of annealing, is because if it cools too quickly, glass is actually shrinking, it's contracting as it's cooling. It expands when it heats and it contracts when it cools. And if that different areas of thickness are moving at different rates because they're cooling too fast, they can't keep up with one another, Soda lime glass will crack. Thermal shock will set in, it will crack to release the tension. But borosilicate, you can get away with that. Um, it has a much lower thermal expansion, so the rate of which it expands and contracts is much, much, much smaller than the soda lime glass. Our flame working team works with tubing and rods of glass, and they use a torch that's even hotter than this one. This has two dials, one for natural gas, one for oxygen. They work with a torch that has four different gas, um, or excuse me, four different dials on there. There's an inner flame and an outer flame, but they can crank that one up real hot. You want me to catch that? 
and get it into the, it's going to be a little bit, okay. I'm going to stand by here. Jeff is going to let that gather set up. He'll go in for his final dip once Helen's ready. And I'll be the one that catches the cup. Got some Kevlar gloves to do that. Kevlar is a really good insulated material. These are pretty puffy and they can hold, I could hold a thousand degree piece of glass for probably a minute with this particular pair with no issues. At the end of the process to get the bowl into the oven, you'll see Katie doing the same thing, but she'll probably suit up with a little bit more PPE, face shield, maybe an aluminized jacket. We'll see. By talking a little bit more about glass itself, soda lime is one of the most common types. So most windows, jars, bottles, light bulbs, uh, this is all soda lime down here. That's almost all soda lime. There's a lot of different formulations of it. So what I mean by that is you can take another type of soda lime glass, say ketchup bottles, and you could throw those into our furnace full of soda lime glass, but they're different compatibilities. There's what's called a coefficient of expansion, a COE to every glass. So we just talked about how borosilica has a low coefficient of expansion, um, but soda lime's different. And there are different types of soda lime. So if you mix different types of soda lime together, you can actually melt them and make something out of them. But in the cooling process, if they're not compatible COE, they're gonna crack. So we have to be very specific about the glass that we're melting, and the color that we use. But that factory, the Reichenbach factory that we buy our color from, they specialize in that color, and that's their suit. Their, I think their COE is 96. That's what we're working anyway, is a 96 coefficient. So if you use incompatible color, glass will crack. So Helen has opened that up. She's been using rotation to flare that open. You need a paddle or anything, Helen? You okay? I think I'm good. All right. So when you go to do a stuffed cup, the idea here is to not just have a straight sided cup. You don't want it to be too flared either. We have to think about the gather fitting nicely into it. So when we take this cup and we set it straight up and down, you can't have it go in either. If it's tapered in, you can't squeeze the gather in properly without filling air in the bottom of it. So it's really important that the shape of the cup is just right. The shape of the gather that Jeff is gonna take is just right. Everything has to be spot on for this. So it's kind of like measure twice, cut once, right? All right, so I'm ready with the gloves. Looks like Jeff might tweak the cup a little bit to his liking. No, I think he said he wants to shrink it down a little bit, so I'll take those gloves off for a moment. Any other questions in here? While we're waiting for this step. Yes? I think it's raised a lot of awareness. Um, for those of you who couldn't hear a question, everybody online, we just had a question has blown away. The reality show um, that's right now on Netflix about glass blowing, has that changed uh, interest in glass making? And I think it's raised a lot of awareness to people that didn't know much about it. And we've, we've loved it. Has anybody here seen that show? Yeah, lots of people. Okay, um, it's, a, it's a really fun show. We had a team go up and assist with the final two episodes of season one and two, and both of those seasons are available on Netflix. It's a lot of fun to be a part of. Um, and we love glass. I mean, all of us here love blowing glass, but it's so much fun to share that with other people too. We're spoiled because we get to do it every single day here at the museum. We get to present this art form to everybody that comes here. We get to talk about it. We're talking to it online right now, so to the global community that's out there. And I think that that show has really hit the hammer, like, or hit the nail right on the head with that. Um, it's a great way to sort of get that exposure out there. But we've had a lot of people come in here and directly ask about Blown Away. And we love to ask people about that too, if they've seen that. Right now we have a display of some of the pieces that were made in season two up on our West Bridge. Um, so if you leave the amphitheater and you go through those doors, you swing a right and you'll walk right to that display. So a lot of fun, really cool program. It was uh, filmed up in Hamilton, Ontario. It's a few hours north of here, just on the other side of the border from basically Buffalo in a very large hot shop with a lot of reheating ovens, real hot. <laughs> it was really lots of heat. This shop, this amphitheater shop is quite comfortable. Now any glass studio is gonna be hot no matter what, but this one has really good ventilation and there's air handlers under our hood right here that pull all the exhaust up and out and um, dump it right out into the alleyway behind us. We're pretty spoiled with the AC vents too. These vents that pop up out of the floor, there's air conditioning coming out of those right now. So we're pretty fortunate.
Yeah, so the I don't want to I don't want to give anything away, but the person that won season 2 still has not come for their residency and I'm being very careful not to t use the wrong terminology here. Um, but that person has won the award to get the residency here to come here and work with us. Uh, I think it's for a week, maybe two weeks. But that was pretty much completed right before the pandemic and that kind of, you know, put the halt on many of our programs, that included. But that person will eventually make it here, so stay tuned for that. All right, so Jeff has taken, I think, his final gather. Helen's going to break this cup free into my gloves. I'm going to get it into this mold straight up and down for Jeff. There we go, nice and easy. So I'll also kind of stand by. I stand that as upright as I can, but I'm going to hold the outside of this cup while he fills it. Just lightly. You guys got shears to cut this free? I'll get it. I think that deserves a round of applause though. Let's give it up for the team. That's one of those stressful moments where it's like, everything's gotta be spot on. Okay, so you see what I was talking about though, right? So getting that cup perfectly up and down, getting the right amount of glass to fill it, one shot deal. I don't know if you could see it. I tried to open my gloves up a little bit so you folks here could see. But when he aimed for the center of the cup, he got the tip of his gather to touch the bottom of the cup first. And then it filled from the bottom up. That's really important. If you have the wrong shape on your gather, or wrong shape on the cup, or say the cup was tilted, you might hit the bottom side. And then when you do that, you start to fill it and you trap a gigantic air bubble in between the gather and the cup. That is very bad. You could still make something out of it, but if you have a big air bubble in there, it's not gonna heat right. It's gonna kind of expand as you're heating it. It's just gonna mess everything right up. So nice job. But Yes, exactly. So the purpose of making that really big cup is so we could take that little bit of color that needed to stretch to get the right density look, stretch it and get it on the outside so that we could fill it with all that clear glass. Yep, that's exactly the purpose of that. I'll get that mold out of the way for me. I don't need that anymore. But I was talking a little bit about why we let that, that core that I was building get really cold. And remember, cold just means rigid. We let it get really rigid so he could take several reheats and once he gets this really cinched down around the back side of the pipe, we call them oil, and you're gonna see him start to do a lot of the contouring to get the shoulder sections carved in there, get some of the contour of the body and the back end and whatnot and the neck, um, begin the, the curves of the arms. Get a lot of heat on the surface so we can do that without that whole gather getting soft. Because if that whole gather gets soft and he starts to push on it with those paddles, the whole gather just slumps right down to the ground and it's really hard to control. So this is a, a time sensitive uh, series of moves to do that because the more reheats you take from this point on, that core does start to soften and it will start to move around. So this is where you, you start to get those indents put in there pretty quickly. But that's why he let everything get pretty icy before he dipped on it. Of course, we need to make sure we can remove this so you're going to see him work in a, a constriction. This is where Katie has to apply a lot of torque. This is a, a really difficult move, squeezing in the jack line. We call it that because of the tool he uses for that are called jacks. Um, but a nice constriction so we have a weak area to break the bowl free when the time comes. Really important. You could sculpt the most beautiful bowl, but if you don't have a good constriction in there, you're not going to get it off the pipe without destroying it. But you'll see him use a tool just like this one. A lot of different tools. He has some crimps, some tweezers and shears, um, but I think he uses a tag to kind of go in there and carve with just like a big spatula really. So it's got like a, the knife edge on this side is like a butter knife uh, and contour, but really, really useful tool for sculpting. I don't know that you'll see him use it for this piece. He, he probably used it a little bit for the details on the face of the bowl. Same thing as the tag, just a lot smaller, a butter knife. Believe it or not, a butter knife is a staple in a glass studio. It's something every glass maker uses at one point or another, especially for sculpture. Uh, just small details, works really well for that. What are you looking for, Jeff? What do you need? Flat crimps? Helen, he's, he's got them. Jeff has some flat crimps that he'll use to start making some
contours with as well. But this is where Katie really starts to get her work out. She's taking the series of heats for Jeff. Now we are often asked, how do you know when to heat? How long to heat? How do you know what temperature the glass is getting to? We can't read the exact temperatures. And I know I've mentioned a few different temperatures like 1,000 degrees and 2,000 and whatnot. Those are just more or less estimations at certain points. But we can feel the glass. We can feel how soft it is as we're turning. So using our hands and our forearms and our wrists, the torque that we have to apply as we're turning something, especially right now, if you watch, the first time she goes up to the reheating oven, not too hard to turn. As she stays there longer and longer, that glass starts to soften more and more. Gravity's pull feels greater. We have to kick up the torque. You might see her start to really kind of put her shoulders and her back into it to keep things running on center. So that's an indicator. It's a reference for us. On the flip side, as something is getting stiffer or cooler, it's easier to turn. So you can feel that. But you can you know, you really start to read those temperatures through the movement in the material. A lot of it is experience as well, just knowing how long to reheat something if you've done it over and over and over again. So here he's starting with the hind legs. You can already see the way that he's moved a lot more mass of material uh, in one direction or the other. So he has the back already portioned out. So it's about a third compared to two thirds for the front. And once you portion it out and start to kind of carve into the glass like this, it would be really hard, if not impossible, without messing up the color to push more material to the other side. So there's a definite series of steps and a lot of planning that goes into it. And furthermore, for this process, for Jeff and Katie, a lot of practice that went into it. So he's made this many times, and they've really got the moves down. But that's the tag that he's using right there. Jeff has put a glove on. A lot of people are really kind of baffled that we typically don't wear gloves for the most part when we're handling blowpipes. Um, this scale of work, you know, Katie's not wearing gloves, nor, nor Heather, uh, Helen or myself. We don't need them if you know how to handle the tools. You can work comfortably. But when you start sculpting and you're using hot tools and you're getting your hand really close to that wad of glass for a long time, it is nice to have a glove on. Now, he's got the benefit of not having to handle the pipe, so he can keep the glove on the whole time. When you put a glove on, you start to turn the pipe, you lose some of that dexterity. It gets a little bit more challenging. You can still do it, um, but it's really common to see this kind of approach. Katie handles the pipe, delivers it back and forth from the bench to the reheating oven. When you see him preheating a tool, he can do that for any number of reasons, but hot glass sticks to hot metal. So for this particular move, using those pinchers, if those tweezers were cold and he tried to dig into the, the glass and grab it to make pulls like that, chances are they would kind of crack the glass in that little spot. It actually wouldn't grab very well. So preheating the tips, probably just to a couple hundred degrees, helps a lot. It helps that, the metal to kind of grab a hold of the glass. Sometimes we'll preheat the metal before we really kind of dig into something to stop it from cracking the glass too. Um, I mentioned earlier that the metal table, this Marver, metal's a really good heat sink. Pulls heat from the glass very quickly. You can use it intentionally to do that at times, um, but for the most part with sculpting, you want the opposite effect. So you'll see us preheat some tools. We can also cool certain areas. He does have that air gun right there. I don't know if he'll use it much, but that air gun can be used to spot cool. Yeah, that's what he's doing right now. So if he's going to pull the legs a little bit longer and he sees them starting to pull too thin in one spot, blast it with a little bit of air first and that spot kind of stiffens up and then you can pull the bulk of the material instead of making it thinner and thinner. But here you see him using those diamond shears. And there are tool makers all over the world. I'll just show you a couple different shears. I did show you guys the, the diamond shears earlier. This is a smaller pair. It's a company called Cutting Edge, this particular one, out in Chico, California. The straight shears that I'm holding right here come from Murano. It's a business called Carladona. Uh, we have a locally made tool, the Corning Leader, our newspaper pad that's right there on the bench, a great one. The equipment that we're working out of was built by Spiral Arts, a premier glass making equipment company out on the West Coast, right outside Seattle, and they do beautiful work. Uh, these furnaces are really, really nice to work from. We can turn them up to a degree where we want them, and they will maintain that temperature unless you open all the doors on them. They'll maintain that temperature. That's how nice they are. So really good thermostat control on them. And the empty ones we shut off at night. We don't have to have those going when we're not using them. They take about an hour to get up to operating temp, so we light them in the morning. Our melting furnace does go 24-7, though. To work out of it every day, we have to keep all that glass hot. 
that it's just standard. So pulling up the back portion of the legs. Yes? This is not our only hot shop at the museum. That's a really good question. We have another hot shop, which is an all electric hot shop, which is very rare. It's called our innovations stage. And they actually, they have, they just, I think they just finished their program and they had their last show at 345 up there. Um, but that's another shop that we run daily as well to do demonstrations when we're doing special programs down here. If you look to your left, that's our courtyard. Those steps go up to our courtyard stage. There's another glass studio that's out there that we typically run in, this, in the summer season when we have extended programming happening. So that's three hot shops that are here permanently. We have mobile hot shops as well. We have a road show. Um, it's several years old now, but it's still, I still consider it pretty new. Um, a beautiful trailer that has been crafted to turn into a fully functional glass studio. Not quite all the bells and whistles we have down here, not nearly the space, but for a trailer, hot shop, very big, very well equipped. And that can get towed anywhere in the States. We also have other containers, shipping containers that have been converted into glass studios that we can ship around the world. And we have done that. So we have done so much outreach in the past years, taking glass blowing studios to other locations in the world and blown glass there. One program that I loved that um, I was fortunate to be a part of many, many times is called Glass Lab. And that's where we would have a team of glass makers. We would pair up with some designers. Now it might've been an architectural design, a furniture designer, a interior designer, anything. And they would come up with some ideas in glass that we would prototype for them real time right there. So we could have them on the floor with us and giving us feedback real time saying, oh, I like it if you adjust it this way or do that with it, or can we try this? A lot of fun, such a great program. And that has taken us all over the world as well. There was one program um, we were posted up right outside the Museum of Decorative Arts with Glass Lab, which is on the lawn right next to the Louvre in Paris. It was phenomenal. I, I, yeah, I have to pinch myself to really believe that it actually happened. That was many years ago, but what an amazing program. We probably worked with, I think, 15 different designers throughout that week. Lots of fun. But our museum, really our mission, it's a, the mission statement in a nutshell is basically to tell the world about glass, to educate and bring to light and blown away. You know, we were just talking about the way that that's done that as well. Um, but that's what we do here. We're, we're not just glass makers, but we're educators as well. We really share the passion, talk about the material, showcase the material, really engage visitors all over the world with it. And that outreach was a huge part of that. Now, as we move something back and forth from this bench to the yoke, that rolling system that Katie's using right now, you can see that that yoke is invested. There's a track, it's on rails, and that cart has four wheels. So it's positioned on that track. It's not gonna go side to side. When you're working heavier work especially, that is really nice. That's a nice feature to have, because when you push it in and out, it's locked into place and it's not gonna alter. It stays on center with the reheating oven at all times. The rolling system is nice because it just moves your fulcrum for you, right? So you can get better leverage as you're going deeper in the oven. Or when you go to bring the piece back to the bench, you can pull it back and just, you know, help to carry the load so you're not doing all that heavy lifting or all, all that distance every single time. And for this particular piece, I'm sure the trips back and forth are going to be close to 100. But each time she moves back and forth, she doesn't just come and slam the piece down on the bench arm, you know, and just let the weight of it drop down on it. You have to be really delicate especially when we start making little constrictions to get the piece to break free, you gotta be really careful with those constrictions to not let something just pop right off by you know, being a little too forceful with it. So remember we have the head sculpted, resting in the garage. We also have another little tube and I mentioned earlier that we're gonna go through a series of different color applications or applications to get color with clear glass inside of it. And one of those applications, really interesting one, I've seen um, people do this multiple times, and Jeff for the tail, we call it a snorkel. So he has a tube of that gray glass, and I think, or you're doing a snorkel for the, the tail. He's gonna kind of bend that tube, and we're gonna plunge it into the furnace, and we can actually suck glass up into that tube. It's not a dangerous thing to do because the hot air that's going into it stops as soon as it hits the, the blow pipe. It doesn't like, the glass doesn't go through the pipe and you're not gonna suck it up. There's no chance of that happening. Um, but it's a pretty interesting little maneuver that he'll do. 
So that tail will be the final thing that we put on here. But we talked about how we need to transfer pieces multiple times. We transferred the head once. Um, we're going to transfer the body off from this blowpipe that we're on to a larger punty that Helen's making. We'll make one final punty right after the head gets put on because where we put this punty is going to be where we need to put the tail. So there's a lot of planning that goes into this whole process of how do I position this? I sculpt one area, then how do I sculpt the other area? So right now, he's pretty much done with the back, but he needs to put the details for the front legs and then the head on. But the punty's going to be right here, so we need to get the tail on there. So for that final move, once the head and the front arms are sculpted, we're going to make one last punty to stick to the belly. Once that's in place, then we have everything else complete. All we need to do is minimal reheats and stick the tail on. So if you put the tail on right now and you could put the punty there, that tail is so thin with all the reheats that we're going to have to do, that tail just wobbles around the whole time. So you don't want that to happen. So you think about those thinner areas and the final details, those fine details going at the very, very end of the process. Oh, that's where that went. We were using that right. I'm going to set this over here. Get it? No, 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 it's fine. I was looking for that rag earlier as well. I didn't know that's where it went. I'm just going to set the bowl over here safely out of the way. Um, Jeff and I were talking right before he began the program tonight about this particular piece. And this piece actually will be for sale. Now, I don't know for what the, the amount will be, um, but it will be for sale through our shops here. So the, the team here, Megan Bunnell, she's been working with our team to, to price point certain things like this. This piece will be for sale with a stand as well. So you folks in-house, and I, don't, I doubt that we have a camera that can get over there to show people online, but that piece over there that's on display, that bowl, the cherry red color, the, the stand that that is on, it'll be a stand just like that. It's made in-house. Tom Ryder's our technician. Um, he did a great job welding that one together and painting it that matte black finish. We'll do the same thing. Oh, great, Matt. Thank you. Matt did get a nice shot of that. We have cameras all around us here. There you go. Thanks, Matt. I appreciate that. So very similar to that, different color. I think the stand will be the same, that black color. Um, but this bowl, obviously, that transparent gray, neutral gray. So Helen's fashioning up the punty, and she's done two gathers on this. We call this a cold core punty or a sculptural punty. When you attach this one, the core that she gathered up and shaped, she let that get kind of cold, kind of rigid. And then she just put a little layer of clear glass over it. So that little layer is really nice and soft on the tip, really good to make contact with the bowl and, and kind of really fuse to it for a bit. Um, but the core, it'll stiffen up pretty fast too. So as soon as they attach it, it'll be a nice, good connection, stir, uh, strong connection, but it will turn sturdy fast enough by the temperature. Does that make sense? I don't know if I'm explaining that well enough. If you have one big gather and you put it on there, the whole gather is really soft. And then when she catches it, it's really hard to control. So that cold core, the timing here, them just kind of hanging out and waiting for a few moments, that core stabilizes, and then she has a lot more control over it. That is especially used on really long work, like a really tall, say a really tall cylinder that you need to punty to the bottom of, and it's really heavy. If you have an unstable punty that's really soft and you catch it, the weight of that cylinder just wants to tilt forward, and it's really hard to turn. So often you'll see glass makers use a cold core punty for something of that nature too. But here he uses a little bit of water, creating stress cracks, thermal shock, and a good hard tap to do it. Let's give him a big round of applause for that. Nice job. It looks so easy when you have a skilled team doing it, right? You're like, well, all they did is drip water on it and bang on the pipe. But a lot of timing and temperature management and just coordination between the team. All right. Any other questions that I can answer? Yes. The, that she's on right now? This thing. This is a pipe cooler. So when we come out of that oven, and the, the pipe is a little bit hotter further back, we can cool it off. So we set it in here, and there's a little pump. So a foot pedal pumps some cool water into that trough, and it just cools the pipe off. Yep, a really nice addition. Most studios will have some variation of this to cool the pipes if they want to or if they need to. And a lot of studios have a battery-powered pump. So you just press a pedal or a foot switch, and you just hold it, and the water flows into it. 
This, again, this was made by Spiral Arts, and we don't have a battery for it, which we really like, because you don't have to charge it or replace it ever. Um, it's just a foot action pump. I've gotten so used to it, it took me a long time to get used to it, because normally you just come over here and press it, and you're like, nothing's happening. No water's filling it. But we got used to pumping it. Now when I go to different studios, that's the first thing I do. I set it in there, and I start to pump it. I'm like, oh, you don't need to. It's a battery-activated pump. On the flip side of that, when visiting artists come here and they never worked with this one, they do the same thing. They just come and they press it and they're like, nothing's happening. And then we, they're like, no, you got to pump up and down. And the first thing they're doing is like, you know, slapping their leg like they're dancing at the country line show. But great piece of equipment. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Yes, the, the glass that was left over on the punty that we put in the bucket over there. As that glass cools very rapidly, it's going to break, and it actually kind of shatters off from the pipe. That's why we put it into that closed bin. You'll probably hear it throughout the next like five to 10 minutes. You're going to hear it break. That's a pretty good size moil that's on there too. So a lot of stress, and you'll hear that. It'll bang. Um, but we could, we're going to ask if we reuse it, if we remelt it. You could. You could certainly remelt that down, and it would be no problem. You could work with it. One, there's some color mixed in with it, though. So that would contaminate the furnace of clear. So we won't, yeah. Even the metal from the pipe leaves a little scale on that glass, and that can discolor the clear glass as well. So even if there wasn't any gray color on there, we still wouldn't remelt that particular bit. Um, but the answer is you could remelt it. You could certainly reuse it, and some places do. It doesn't go to waste, though. We put that scrap. When we come in in the morning, we empty that bin. We shovel that into a separate dumpster, and that dumpster is emptied uh, usually every other week. There's a company that can take it and grind it up really fine and mix it in for aggregate. They can mix it in for like pavement and blacktop and use it for filler like that. So it doesn't go to waste. Yep. Some bit, you know, if we were making, uh, you know, like cobalt blue pieces or something, you were mixing the frit in there with the blue, you could take those chunks of, of glass and melt them down, and you wouldn't notice that it was discolored at all. It would actually be totally fine. We work on so many different specialty projects in here that that's our only furnace of clear glass. We want to keep it pretty clean. Yep. It is 96 exclusively. Um, actually, the glass that we have been melting was from a business called Spectrum Glass. We've been using them for more than 10 years. They're no longer in business. Um, we still have a lot of material because we ordered pallets upon pallets. Um, that's still what we're working with. But we're now in the process of finding a new glass to work with. And I believe the new glass that we just melted is also 96, or it's very, very close to it. Yeah, there's a little bit of wiggle room in terms of the colors that we apply. And that 96 or 94, or 95, there is a little bit of wiggle room there. But different types of glass work differently. We've, we melted um, Boma is the name of the color that we just started to play around with in a smaller furnace. We have a smaller furnace. And we. It's a nice glass. It's really pretty, but it works differently. The timing's a little different. The viscosity curve is different. So as you're working it, you can feel when it stiffens up compared to our glass. So you just have to adapt to it. And we will. You know, we certainly will. But it's very, very different for sure. Even in cullet compared to batch. So I think I was talking about the raw materials, the silica sand, sodash, and limestone. There's a company called Spruce Pine that mixes those materials. It's called batch. And they bag it, and they ship that out. And you can melt batch. Batch shoveled into that furnace will melt into glass, but it needs a little bit more time than cull it. It also needs more heat. So you got to turn the oven up when you charge it. That's what we call filling it up with batch. Um, it turns into a, a great glass if you melt it properly. Batch, though, has a longer viscosity curve compared to the cull it. So it stays soft for a long time because it hasn't gone through that secondary melt. When you melt glass over and over again, when you regenerate that cullet, it does lose some of the flux. And the flux is what helps it to stay soft for a little bit longer. So the more you regenerate cullet, say you, you melt it three times, four times, five times, each melt, the same glass, it's going to get lesser and lesser quality. It's going to become a little bit stiffer to work. It can become more brittle. It can develop what we call cord, which are irregularities in the glass that um, do any number of things, but it's not nice. Cord is not good. So when we melt, if we do regenerate glass, we usually shovel in some fresh stuff at the same time to just kind of keep it, keep it nice. But uh, to make the colors, most of the colors, there are some colors you can make using cullet. But to make some of the rubies I know, and I think some of the purples as well, you have to have the batch. Because when you melt those different metal oxides in with it, 
uh, to make that specific color, you need that chemical reaction. So you need the batch to be chemically turning into glass at the same time. But I know like blues and greens, you can throw cobalt oxide in with it and it'll turn it to blue, no problem. Um, so some of the colors, it's fine. So yeah, this is a good display of uh, teamwork. Katie taking that big reheat. You can see half of the body of that bowl is glowing bright orange. The other half is not. So really getting the heat in just one specific area, very important now to not lose the detail on the back legs. And that has some of what to do with Jeff using the torch to guide the heat, but a lot of what Katie is doing as she's heating in the oven. Right now, you can see she's deep in the furnace. This is a flash heat. That's to make sure that everything stays above that 900 degrees, but then she backs out and she's reading the heat and the movement by just staying partway in that oven door. So she's focusing temperature where she needs it. Every hot shop works differently, or every reheating oven, I should say. These have two burners firing into them. So if you all are looking at it like the face of a clock, positioned at 10 o'clock, we have one burner in the front, and then towards the back, there's another burner. So they're pointing downward. We've worked out of these for several years, so we know exactly where that line of heat is. Now, there's heat coming out of the front of the door no matter what, but if you want to get a lot of heat in one area, you position it right in front of that first, that first burner. But other studios have burners in different areas, so you have to kind of learn the studios when you go there. It's almost like cooking in somebody else's kitchen, right? I was talking about our electric hot shop. That works very differently. When you're melting glass in an electric furnace, you get it to the same viscosity, it's pretty much the same as gas. When you're reheating glass, in an electric furnace, it takes a long time to soften it. The electric heat is a, what I call a very soft heat because you don't have that flame shooting in there. You don't have that hot spot. So when you get the glass in there, it just takes a long time to soften it. So the rhythm is really different. And again, using a kitchen as an analogy, if you've cooked on gas and then you go to an electric burner and you turn it up, it takes a long time for that heat to climb, same kind of thing. If my girlfriend's listening right now, she knows what I'm talking about. She has an electric, electric stove that I have a really hard time using. All right, I'm just going to take a little look in the garage here. The head of the bowl is sitting safe and sound. That little snorkel is ready to go for the tail. That garage has two different zones. We have two separate doors on it. One side is what we call the hot side, the other side is the cold side. And again, cold is relative, right? The hot side is where the burner is firing in. And in front of that burner, the temperature is probably around 1500 Fahrenheit. Now, if you made the head of the bowl and you set it right in front of that burner, even though the, the head of the bowl is solid, you come back about an hour later, it's going to be a puddle, right? Because 1500 degrees is hot enough to soften it. So we can put pieces on the colder side, keeps them nice and stable, keeps them rigid, maintain their shape. But before you pull them out of that garage and you expose them to air temperature, even for just a brief moment, you want to shuffle them to the hot side. You want to preheat them a little bit. Then when you get enough heat in them, you can pull them out of the garage and it gives you just a few seconds to get to one of the reheating ovens and get them to a safer temperature. Um, but that garage is really useful for sculpting parts like this. Very useful. We were talking about Jeff and his Venetian style glass making. This is one of the ones that he made not too, too long ago. Beautiful piece, right? Absolutely gorgeous, made in sections. The foot and the cup were made separately. This sort of uh, whimsical, mythological seahorse creature was made separately. And they were all joined because all the parts were put in the garage and then pulled out when everything was done and put together using a series of little glue bits and whatnot. This, the centerpiece for this particular goblet was made, but he didn't use any torches for this. The Venetian methods, you can use a torch to make these little details, but if you look at this seahorse, and it's not really a seahorse, right, but this, this mythological creature, if you look at it really closely, all these little bits were little tiny bits of glass that were brought over one by one, attached to the body, cut free, crimped for texture, and pulled or bent. Very rapid work, very, very, very rapid work. So for this bowl, he's sculpting it mostly all out of one piece. And it would be really hard to do something like this without using that torch. Um, but these are all added bits. And this has gold leaf that's been applied to, a little bit of gold foil that was put on there. But beautiful piece. Venetian style work, Jeff is very, very good at. I'm going to be right back. I'm just going to drink a little bit of water, so bear with me.
Okay, sorry about that. Any other questions about what's going on? Yeah, go ahead. How long have I been doing? Uh, how long until you know what you're doing? Is that what you... Me personally, about 21 years for myself. I've been here at the museum since 2009, full time. Um, I started in a production studio in Massachusetts. I moved to Corning to work at Steuben Glass Factory when it was still operating, when it was still a factory, and then uh, joined the museum a few years after that. And my first, my first full-time job was actually on the cruise ships that I was talking, or I didn't talk about the cruise ships, I talked about the electric studio. Our museum was partnered with Celebrity Cruise Lines for about 10 years. We had a program on board their vessels. There were three cruise ships in their celebrity class, of their solstice class fleet. Helen and myself were both team leaders on all three of those ships. Um, we went out there for many contracts, I think probably 10 contracts in total for both of us to join a team and work on board that vessel, creating glass every day, every night for the visitors on board. An electric studio was developed for that program, specifically for that program. Our museum actually received the patent, along with Spiral Arts, the equipment builder, for the all-electric hot shop. It had never been done before. Um, so those were fitted onto three of their ships, their brand new ships, and pulling power from the generators on board we had an electric studio to blow glass, just like you're watching right now. No torches out there. We didn't use torches. We actually had torches at one point, um, just the propane torch. But to get the gas on board, to supply the gas, was a logistic nightmare. So we just kind of stopped it entirely. And we just started to use all the electric ovens instead of the torches. Um, but that was my first, my first sign on with the museum, was on the cruise ships. And I worked all year round, either there or here. Uh, any number of those vessels, any number of itineraries that they sailed through. Um, but I th think I heard you ask, like, how, until you're comfortable, like, how long does it take to get comfortable? Maybe I misheard you, but I, I'll jump on that point. That most people, usually a few years of working in a glass studio until you're comfortable with how to move, how to operate, how to be an assistant. A traditional apprenticeship, you know, most of those were found in factory environments. If you were, you know, a factory worker 100 years ago or a couple hundred years ago making bottles or, you know, windows, light bulbs, anything like that. Um, a team of glassmakers to use you as an assistant, usually you would have had about five years of an apprenticeship. After five full-time years of training, the senior members would say, you're good enough to give me a hand. To give me a hand, not to actually make the work, to, to help out. Um, and that's, I mean, it's really accurate. You know, it, I remember after five full-time years of working in production style, I thought I knew everything. Five years later, I figured out I didn't know anything. I mean, I knew a little bit, obviously, but it's a material that if you keep pushing yourself, if you have the drive and the desire, then you can keep learning. It's, you know, there, I don't think you can truly perfect everything with glass. It's such an amazing material, and there's just so much to it. That you could be a glass sculptor and you never make, you know, fine-tuned goblets. And if you've sculpted bowls for 25 years, you might be a master at making bowls. But if you've never, ever made a Venetian cup, chances are your first one is not going to be perfect, right? I tell people a lot that it's kind of like playing a musical instrument. It takes a long time just to get that muscle memory down to the point where when you're turning gathers glass, your brain doesn't have to talk to your hand anymore. Your hand just does it. It just has that muscle memory and dexterity to do it. And that can easily take a few years. But some of the other basics, like gathering glass, you know, early on, Helen did the, the blowing portion for the cup, gathering glass evenly, shaping it evenly, knowing the heat right enough that when you blow, you blow a nice even bubble. Because if your heat's wrong, if it's uneven heat, that bubble blows out uneven. So a nice, nice even bubble with consistency to be able to transfer something, to break it free from the pipe to a punty without having anything go wrong, to do that with consistency can take several years. This is a very, very advanced piece, you know, making something like this. This is very technical in many, many ways. I'm talking about the different areas of thickness, you know, the mass, the body of that bowl, getting those areas hot enough to really start doing those moves without losing the details of those little appendages that are on there. You know, learning those ins and outs of it takes a lot of skill and a lot of practice. Again, you know, Jeff has made this bowl probably, you know, at least a dozen times in the last several months. That's Katie, yes. She has worked with Jeff quite a bit. Big trust, absolutely. Lots of trust in a glass studio. You need it to work as a team, absolutely. Um, 
I won't ask them right now because they're really in the thick of it, but I think that they probably made at least a dozen of these in the last several months. And so between, and she has helped him with, I think, every single one of those because Katie was on the team with, how many of these do you think? Probably 14, 15, she said. Seven, eight, <laughs> differing stories. I think it's been at least a dozen, but I don't know. Um, but enough, enough that they have gotten the communication, the moves down for it. It almost looks like it's just intuitive. You know, like the team just is, they're reading each other's minds. Um, but in the beginning process, you know, Jeff will say, oh, take it for this heat or this area right here. That's where I want it to be soft. Um, you know, there's a lot of communication that's happening. Sometimes it's not even verbal. It might even just be like a little head nod for the, you know, like, okay, I'm ready for the, the tail now. Like a little head nod across the studio. But we're coming pretty close. I think Helen actually has the, the head on a punty. Yes, she does. She's created a little punty to attach to the nose, the muzzle of the, of the bowl. When do you want me to start that punty? Brush? Yep, got it. Sounds good. Okay. So I'm just I'm going to jump back in here pretty, pretty soon and make that final punty. But Helen has pulled the head of the bowl out of the garage on that little punty. And this is a little whisk broom. So the garage, even though the garage floor of the garage is pretty clean, there's a little bit of dust in there. The garage is built out of fire brick, and then we have kiln shelving on the floor of it. Um, but the fire brick from opening and closing the door is a little bit of dust settles onto it. And the dust can kind of stick to the head of the bowl. It's not embedded in it because the head of the bowl wasn't soft when it went in. But before you soften it, you got to brush the dust off. Otherwise, it will embed. It will ad adhere permanently to it. So we just use that little whisk broom to take care of that. So I'm just listening in right now. Jeff just said, if there's any residual glass left where that one punty, when they made the head of the bowl, they broke it off into the garage. If there's any glass left on there from that punty, torch it, see if you can soften it or maybe even pull it off there with a little pair of tweezers. So these two workstations, uh, the reheating oven that Helen has is a little smaller than our main one, but they're both equipped with these, these hot torches. So again, this studio, great studio to work in. But this is where you're going to see Helen take some kind of brief reheats, maintaining the temperature of the head of the bowl. Jeff's going to work a lot of soft heat into that neck that he's just formed. And he'll take the punty from Helen once he's ready. But that is in a position where she puntied on the nose to be able to get the back side of the head pressed right into the neck. So he's going to get that really, really hot and soft and kind of work it back and forth when he attaches it. We'll break it off this punty. And I'm just standing by because I'll make that final punty, the bigger one, that will attach to the belly of the bowl when he's ready. And then we'll get the tail attached and that will, that'll be it. Start it. This is just one big gather you said, right? Okay. It's another one of those one-shot deals. As soon as he makes contact, it's going to stick. Right behind you, Alan. Okay. And here he, I heard him just say flip to Katie. And we'll tap to break it free. What do you all think of that? <laughs> nice job. So that connection is still very, very soft. He can work that around. He can turn the head of the bowl if he wants to give it a little gesture. He can press it on there a little bit harder if he needs to, widen the connection to the neck. But you want to do it pretty much in this reheat or the next before it starts to stiffen up. Because now, if you start to reheat it more and more, the, the head starts to soften, the horns start to soften and whatnot, so. But for this punny that I'm making, the one that will be attached to the belly, the underside of the belly, just a nice dome shape. I'm going to let this stabilize. We don't need more glass on this, but I will let this cool slightly, and then I'm going to heat the very, very tip of it for contact, similar to what Helen did for that cold core punny. And this isn't me making a decision like, oh, I think this would be the best kind of punny for Jeff. It was Jeff telling me when we worked through this process a few days ago, 
this is the type of putty I want. So it really comes down to the gaffer, the one that's in charge. All right. You ready this time, Jeff? Yep. Yeah? Okay. Yep. I am ready. I'll give this just one more light heat. And I'm good. Coming at you. A little bit of water on his punty and a swift tap. Do the rest. There we go. Nicely done. Yeah, and this repositioning is where we need to have some extra doors because now we're not really linear. That's great, Katie. Thank you. With the bowl anymore. Let's be able to squeeze in and out. So we're pretty much done with the body of the bowl. Jeff is going to do that snorkel technique that I talked about. You want to take over? It doesn't matter. I'm, I'm good either way. Okay. Yeah, sure. If you want to just torch the, the arms and the legs and whatnot for me, that'd be great. So they have taken that little snorkel of gray. Jeff just filled it with clear glass by doing that snorkeling move. And it looks like Helen will start to work a lot of the heat into it. And we're going to turn that into the tail. And we're just going to kind of hang out with this, keep everything the right temperature through a series of overall heats, flash heats, and using that torch. Those thinner parts really do cool down so much faster. So at times you see Jeff using the, do you want it side to side, Jeff, or? Uh, no, up and down. Straight up and down is fine? Okay. And now cleaning up that last punty this broke free from, just the site where the tail will attach to, smoothing that glass out. He might recontour it a little bit, but we're still working with gravity. You can see the punty that I have is still slightly soft and the piece will slump down. So we turn back and forth to keep it on center best we can. It's actually nice at this stage to have a little bit of movement in my punty. It's kind of, uh, we just know that it's, it's hot enough to be stable if it's got a little movement to it. We can see the color in the punty as well. It's got a slight yellow tint, which is the heat, and that's a good sign. If a punty, and this is a good tip for anybody that's out there working with glass starting off, if a punty ever looks like it's completely colorless, that's a bad thing. You want it to have a little bit of color to it. When it gets too cold, especially with a heavier piece like this, it can just drop right off. Looks great, Jeff. Yeah. And if anybody is curious about seeing images after the fact, after something is made, or really any programming that we do here at the museum, Amanda here is getting some photos and probably video clips of this process. And she puts a lot of stuff onto social media for our museum, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Flickr. So you can follow us on any of those. And great way to see a lot of different content. And Amanda's been getting a lot of great content lately. So Jeff said one quick flash. Looks like Helen has the bit for the tail ready. I'll let this slump down for just a second and flip it up. You got the punty, Jeff. When you watch us put a handle on a pitcher, this is really the same kind of procedure, except we won't reattach this to make it a handle.
I love that part. What do y'all think of that? Nice detail. Gotcha. I'll give you a quick flash. So that tail still has some movement. And this is where I'm going to be really attentive to make sure it doesn't slump in on itself or touch down somewhere else and stick. So I'll just give it a very quick flash heat. We'll do a little more tor torch work. Mincing my words here. But that's pretty much it. And then we just have to balance the temperatures out and get this off the punty into the annealing oven for slow cooling. See Katie gearing up. She's got the Kevlar glove. She's put a hoodie on for arms protection. She has a face shield because she needs to carefully lean into a 900 degree oven with this bowl in hand and carefully set it down. And I can tell you, I loaded one or two of these in an oven. They're very tricky to load because they're pretty heavy with a lot of mass, but those really thin legs, hooves and tail, you don't want to just set it down too hard in that annealer. Those delicate parts. Last flash, Jeff says. All right. To get this off the punty, he's going to use a little water. And when we drop water on the punty, especially at this end stage, we're really careful not to let any water hit the body of the piece. So one thing I'll do is drop the back end of this down in just a second. And when we drop the back of this punny down, lifting the piece in the air, it just lets water fall away from the piece. So usually a drop on one side and a drop on the other side to match and a swift tap to do it. Breaks right free. Let's hold our applause for just a second. We're going to fire polish and let Katie concentrate on the careful walk over to the annealer. Once we get it into the oven and the door is closed, we'll give all our enthusiasm to the team here. This is where it's tricky because you've got to get your glove out from underneath of it without letting the legs slam onto the annealer floor. And she's done a great job. Let's give it up for the team. That's Jeff, Matt, Katie Hubs, and Helen Tegler. Thank you to Matt up there in the booth and Amanda online. Thank you to everybody here joining with us and everybody online as well. An incredible demonstration. I'm going to give Jeff a, a handshake for that one. Nice job, man. Beautiful work. And that will wrap up our program. I want to thank you all very, very much for coming to see us tonight. We do appreciate it. Enjoy the rest of your evening. So long.